Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wagner, I think you told us this morning that one of the first things that you did when you got into Mr. Hoff's trailer was to pull him into another room. I think in your words you said you, you wanted to, to holler at him? That's correct. Okay. And if I understand correctly, the whole purpose in doing that was to alert him about what you and your co-defendant, Drew Blonick, were going to do with Chris Bagley, right? That's correct. And uh, was it your, or were, was it your, your terminology that you told Paul Hoff that you and Drew Blonick were going to fuck him up? That's correct. Okay. And I mean, that was the intent all along, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. When you went over there, and when you say you went over there, you told Paul Hoff that you and Drew Blonick were going to fuck him up. What did you mean by that? Uh, my intent was to pull Paul Hoff aside um, so the defendant could handle it one on one. And then if that didn't happen, that uh, the defendant and I were going to uh, jump him. Okay. But what I'm driving at here, I want to get understand your intent. When you went to Hoff's trailer that night with Drew Blonick, I mean, what was your intent with regard to Chris Bagley? I mean, what were you there for? Uh, to make sure the defendant wasn't by himself, to like back him up, uh, to talk Paul Hoff into being, I guess, okay with it, okay. Um, to drive. And when you went with Drew Blonick to the trailer, I mean, you were part of the plan, weren't you? That's correct at that point, yes. Okay. And during this early tussle you described, this tussle with, uh, with Chris Bagley, wasn't there a time when you yelled something over to Drew Blonick? Yes. And what did you yell to him? Fuck him up. And when you said, fuck him up to Drew Blonick, what did you mean by that? Come take over. Uh, I, I was in the middle of a wrestling match with Chris, and I was trying to get out of it. And what did you think he was going to do? Take over, punch him, kick him, possibly stab him. A anything that he was, <clears throat> however he was going to handle it. I just wanted out of the situation myself personally. Well, earlier in the evening, I thought you said that Drew Blonick motioned towards a knife. That's correct. Okay. Didn't you think he was going to use that knife? Yeah, in the middle of the heat of the moment, it wasn't where I was thinking, you know, specifically stab him. Uh, but that could have been one of, you know, obviously his intent beforehand. Okay. So I knew that that was on the table. Well, that was certainly your intent, wasn't it, in going over there in the first place? You and Drew Blonick were going to go over there to kill, kill Chris? Me personally? Yes. Me personally, no. Uh, me there so he could handle it one-on-one? -on -one? Yes. And that's what he alluded to was that he was going to stab him. Well, when you gave your last statement, your last proffer to our office, didn't you tell us during your proffer that when you and Drew Blonick went to Hoff's trailer, it was your intent to kill him. Didn't you say that? My, by intent, meaning the intent of the group as a whole, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, me personally um, stabbing Chris Bagley, no. The defendant, yes. Okay. Before we broke for the lunch hour, I think you were describing how Chris was rolled up in plastic and was taken to the back window of the trailer, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And you were told to move your truck around to the back, is that right? That is correct. And um, you got the keys from on top of the bar? They were handed to me. Okay. Who handed them to you? Handed to me. Yes. Who did? Uh, the defendant. Okay. And then tell us what you did. Uh, I proceeded to uh, back my vehicle up. And I pulled around to the side, and when I pulled around to the side, 
Paul Hoff was outside and he was guiding me uh, back um, through the trailers and where to pull up at. So you, you backed your pickup truck to the back of the trailer itself? I pulled in and then I backed it to the window. Okay. How close were you able to get? Pretty close. Okay. So how was Chris's body then moved from the inside of the trailer to the back of your pickup truck? Uh, Paul Hoff went through the back door <clears throat> and uh, the defendant was on the outside of the window um, next to the tailgate of the pickup. I was around the back to the left of him and Paul Hoff uh, had Chris's body wrapped in plastic and handed him off um, through the window to the defendant. I was holding the piece of plywood up because there happened to be a large piece of plywood in the back of uh, my truck and uh, they told me to grab part of the plastic so I was kind of pulling the plastic as I was holding it up and the defendant was doing most of the uh, actual hauling of Chris's body throughout through the window the majority of the weight I guess. But all three of you were playing a part in moving the body from the trailer to your truck right? Yes that's correct. And you mentioned a sheet of plywood, I think. Yes. Where'd you find that? That just happened to be randomly in the back of the truck. Um, it was um, used on a, the concrete job uh, the day before um, when you're tearing up pieces of old concrete instead of throwing it on uh, the grass, you set them on a big piece of plywood so you don't tear it up before you remove it. What happened then after Chris's body was placed in the, the bed of the pickup truck? Um, put the piece, I put the piece of plywood over. Over the body? Over the body. Okay. And then uh, I got in the truck and drove out the uh, front. And as I got through the um, trailers, because they were like next to each other, butted up against each other, uh, the defendant hopped in the uh, uh, passenger seat and we drove off to my house on Souter. Just you and Drew Blonick? Correct. How about Paul Hoff? No, he stayed at his trailer. Okay. How about Chris's belongings? Did he have a duffel bag of some sort? He had a black um, sack, like a gym bag almost sack, I believe it was. Um, and I saw uh, when I was like sitting there as the after I think it was before or maybe after they wrapped the body in plastic, uh, I saw Paul Hoff going through it. Uh, I know my co-defendant did not or did not have it with him, and I know I didn't ever look through it or had anything to do with it. But I believe Paul Hoff uh, maintained possession of whatever was in that bag. Were you ever able to see what was in that duffel bag? No, no. Okay. Um, it was so black. you don't know what happened to the duffel bag? No, it was black. You, I, I just saw it real quickly when I was uh, in the trailer, but I never saw it after that or uh, ever again. How about the knife that Drew Blonick used? Did you, do you know what happened to that? Yes, well, the knife was in a, a white plastic um, bag that you would maybe get from like Walmart or um, like Hy-Vee um, with some other bloody items I believe uh, and that was at the defendant's feet in my uh, truck and the knife was in there. Okay. How about the gun that Chris Bagley had? Uh, the gun was not with us. I was told at a later date that uh, Paul Hoff had the gun, and I believe the defendant bought the gun back from Paul Hoff and gave it to another individual to get rid of. So as far as you know, when you left, this gun that spilled out during the tussle, the gun that spilled out on the floor, that stayed at the trailer? Yes. Okay. yes. But uh, Drew Blonick had a plastic bag containing the knife he used and some other articles, is that right? Yeah, I believe there might have been, there was, some, there was other thing, something else in there. I don't know if it was like 
a hand towel if there's there was other miscellaneous items in there i didn't look in there but i saw it wasn't just a knife do you know what he did with that ultimately i uh, took it with him when i went back to paul hoff's uh trailer probably an hour and a half later uh I, he had left and he had taken that um because there's some bandit by that point there were some bandages on my hand and some bloody items um, from my house when I wrapped my hand up, when I realized how bad my thumb was cut. And after it was bandaged to the best of my abilities, uh, he took whatever was left from that and uh, I think a t-shirt I had on as well and put them all in that bag and uh, went and got rid of them. How badly was your hand cut? Pretty bad. Um, I didn't realize it until we got, that, until we got to the house and uh, he noticed it, my adrenaline was pumping, but he noticed it, like how bad it was before I did. And I could tell his mind was working. You know, he just like, that's bad, that's not good. That's not good. And it started kind of scaring me, just how he was looking at the injury. And then I started realizing that it wasn't good, that I had a, such a visible injury on a day that, you know, somebody that we all know ended up, uh, you know, disappearing. So how did you uh, treat that injury then? He helped me uh, just, I think, put some gauze in it and wrapped it up with um, just um, some like, gauze tape and uh, just put a bunch of uh, gauze pads down and with the tape and then temporarily had it there and just had a lot of gauze in it, a lot of ointment, and just wrapped it up really, really tight. Okay. I want to ask you again about these videos from the trailer court that we have talked about before. Do you recall seeing some additional videos of your truck uh, leaving the trailer court? Okay. And um, I want to show you, uh, just so you, you're looking first, I want to ask you if you recognize your truck in these videos. And we're going to go back to exhibit number, number 10 and look at clip number 13, I want to ask you just to take a look at this as it starts to play. We're frozen. Just give us one second for technical problems. <laughs> So did that video show your pickup truck leaving the trailer court at 5.48 a.m.? Yes, it did. Okay. And then we'll go on to clip number 14 from exhibit 10.
And again, does that show your pickup truck leave the trailer court that morning at 5.48 a.m.? Yes, it does. Okay. And then finally, I want to show you clip number 15 from exhibit number 10. And again, does clip number 15 show your pickup truck leaving the trailer court on the Mount Vernon Road roughly at 5.48 a.m.? Yes, it does. At this time, Your Honor, I'd offer in evidence video clips number 13, 14, and 15 from State's Exhibit number, number 10 into evidence. None from the state, Your Honor. Okay. At this time, Your Honor, I'd ask for the court's permission uh, to publish clip number 13 from exhibit number 10 to the jury. So is that your pickup truck that we see there leaving the trailer court at roughly 548? Yes. And Drew Blonick is with you? Yes, in the passenger seat. And the body of Chris Bagley is in the bed of the pickup truck? Yes. And there's a piece of plywood over the body? That is correct. Was there anything else placed in the bed of your pickup truck besides the, the body of Chris Bagley? No. Uh, there was a uh, other small piece of plywood, I believe, on the bottom, but uh, nothing else was placed in it, of my knowledge. No. Okay. Then we'll move on to video clip number 14. <coughs> and published clip number 14 for the jury. And again, is that your pickup truck there turning on to Mount Run Road? Yes. Okay. And then finally, number 15. Was that your truck there again we just saw? Yes. With the plywood in the back covering the body of Chris Bagley? That is correct. And where were you headed at that time? To my house. Uh, 
over on Souter Avenue. That is correct. Tell us about the conversation you had with Drew Blonick on the way home. Um, it's just uh, I was having trouble breathing still. Uh, kept looking at my hand and realizing kind of how bad it was. He was kind of looking at it. Like, I can't believe that just happened. He said, uh, you know, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, shouldn't have went down like that. I just need, I just need your help. Just get me to the house and I'll take care of the rest. Just get me to the house, to your house, and I'll take care of the rest. So I drove. So what happened when you got to the house? We got in the house. Uh, he kind of started looking at my hand and uh, just kind of how serious it was. Then knew that it needed st stitches, big time stitches or staples. And it wouldn't stop bleeding. And uh, he kept noting how serious it was. He was he was not really worried about anything else except for how bad that hand was. How am I going to explain that? And uh, so then I started freaking out about it and um, started realizing I need to come up with a reason or excuse why I have this massive obvious wound in my hand that would make no sense. I couldn't think of a reason why I'd have it that I didn't have it yesterday and uh, it started making me nervous. Wasn't there any discussion at, about that time about what to do with Chris's body? Um, yeah. Um, that's about the time when Paul called and was uh, needing, uh, talking about needing tools, um, some saws, some drills, and uh, things like that to uh, remove things that, that had blood stains or probably DNA evidence in his house. So we were talking about that, and then I'm like, well, what about my truck? He's like, it's fine, it's fine, I'll take care of it, but we gotta take care of this first. And then that's when he brought the bag, well, that's when I noticed the bag with the knife um, was in the house, and he said, here, take my shirt off, because I guess I have blood on my shirt, and he wrapped up everything with blood and put it in that bag. And then that's when he looked at me again, he's like, I just need to do one more thing. I, I gotta take care of this. Will you go to Paul Hoff's, and you got, yeah, take him some tools. And uh, that's the last place I wanted to go to. We kind of, not argued, but went back and forth over it. Like, you can't make me go there alone. You know, I, that's the last place I wanted to go to alone. He, and then, you know, he's like, it's daylight out, it'll be fine, you just gotta drop that off. I gotta take care of this, unless you wanna take care of that, and I'll go do it, but I could tell he didn't wanna go there either. So, at that point, uh, it would probably been about an hour, I got in the shower, I changed my clothes, I re-bandaged my hand again another time to try to get it to stop bleeding. He took those bandages as well. And then I believe uh, he left. And then I went, I got into the uh, Nissan Titan and I took a bag of tools over to uh, Paul Hoff's trailer. You talked about how you cleaned up and changed your clothes, rebandaged your hand and so forth. What did you do with your clothes? It was just a shirt okay. um, that had blood on it. But uh, I handed them to him and he put them in a, a garbage bag, a bigger bag. Okay. So this is it, we're talking about a different bag. Yes, uh, he grabbed a garbage bag from underneath my kitchen sink and then put the small bag that came from uh, Paul's house with the knife in this garbage bag with like a shirt and some other stuff. How about Drew Blonick? Did he clean up at your house? I believe so. I don't know. I was in the bathroom at this point. Okay. Uh, I took a shower. He was still there. He was, at, but I believe he might have cleaned up. I don't really know. I can't tell you whether he did or not, but I assumed he did, he did as well. Did he have a change of clothes at your house? No. Or maybe he he might have had some clothes there, but he didn't change his clothes at that point. That I really noticed. You know, he did not have his uh, denim jacket on, though, okay. that he had on earlier. But I don't know if he threw it away or if it was just somewhere I didn't, I didn't ask him. I didn't think about it at the time. So you drove a different truck over back to Paul Hoff, is that That's right? That's correct. 
with some tools. That's correct. And what was your plan at that time? To drop off, to drop off the tools. <clears throat> and then when I got there, you know, I tried to hand Paul the bag. He's like, no, hey, come in. So I reluctantly, I went in and we're talking real quick and his demeanor kind of like totally changed from when I saw him just, you know, an hour and a half ago. Paul Hoff? Yeah. Now, I'm sorry, before you went to Paul Hoff's trailer, did you have some communi communication with Paul Hoff? Well, yeah, I, I told you he called me and then uh, text me and then I called him telling him that I was on my way. You recall what kind of a text Paul Hoff sent to you? He said something, you're buying breakfast or something. And I believe it was in regards to the conversation that him and the defendant had about breakfast um, immediately after Chris was killed. Okay. I don't really know. I believe that's what he was talking about, but I didn't really understand the context. I believe I called him after that. So that was your cue, or did you take that as your cue from Paul Hoff that he wanted some help? That I took it as a cue to call him, okay. so I called him. And that's when you learned that he wanted some help? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so when you drive a different truck over to the trailer, your Chevy with Chris's body, is it still on your premises? Yeah, the defendant had um, pulled it into my garage. And did he say anything more about what was going to be done with the body of Chris Bagley? Nothing at that time. Okay. Did you know what was going to happen? No. I had no idea. And it's still in the back of your pickup truck? Still in the back of my pickup truck, still parked in my garage. Weren't you kind of concerned about that? Uh, at that point in time, no. Okay. Um, my concern was to get, to try to get away from, you know, the defendant because he was going to take care of um, the knife and my next main concern was to get Paul Hoff off my back because I could tell on the phone call he was totally different and kind of makes me nervous I guess and I just wanted to get to his house give him what he needed and remove myself from this situation as quickly as possible. Do you know what Drew Blonick did? No, he left. Uh, I know he left. I believe he got rid of uh, the knife. Okay. Did you drive him home? No, no, okay. he left. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Yep. So tell us what happened then when you got uh, the Hoffs. I went to Hoff's house. I tried to hand him a Milwaukee tools bag full of uh, a couple drills, a couple um, saws, skill saws. Uh, put a couple batteries in it and some chargers. Tried to hand it to him. He's like, no, hey, come in. He's like, I need your help. Show me how this works. Okay. That's what he said on, on the outside of the house. Tell me again, describe this, this other pickup truck that you drove over there. It's a green four-door uh, Nissan Titan with a uh, roof rack on it. A roof rack? Yeah, like a, a, it was uh, welded on. So you can put like a, wood, plywood, there's boards up on it, strap it down. And have you seen the surveillance videos from the trailer court showing that green Nissan Titan return to the trailer court? Yep, that is me uh, by myself uh, with the tools. With the court's permission, I'd like to now uh, display clip number 16 from exhibit number 10. Okay. Okay. The picture on the TV has come back.
I, I think that we can proceed with just a screen, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, let's um, play clip number 16 now from exhibit number 10. Do you see that truck there? Yes. And is that the green Nissan Titan that you drove back to Paul Hoff's that morning? Yes. And the timestamp there, 8.18 a.m., does that comport with your recollection? Yes, that's correct. You were alone at that time? Yes, I was alone. Returning with some tools? Yes. And your intent at that time was to help Paul Hoff? Uh, at, yeah, to drop them off at first, and then it turned into that. Okay. Uh, also want to play clip number 17, if we may. And again, does that just appear to be another shot of you arriving back at Paul Hoff's? Yes. And then finally, if we could play clip number 18 for the jury. Was that your truck again? Yes. Okay. And where did you park when you returned later that morning in your, your green pickup truck? In the front of the house. Okay. And again, tell us what happened then when you got there at the Paul Haas with the tools. I grabbed the bag of uh, Milwaukee tools. I walked up to his front door, tried to hand him the bag. He told me to come in. So I stepped inside. Uh, he's kind of asking me like how they all worked, even though I believe he did know how they all worked. I showed him what I brought and uh, put some full batteries in, uh, some of the things, and plugged the other ones into the wall. And then uh, that's when he started talking about uh, the marijuana that I was going to give him. Uh, the conversation took a more aggressive uh, turn on on his part. It wasn't that I was going to be selling him marijuana, I was going to be giving it to him. And I was going to be giving it to him now. He kind of became aggressive. I think he kind of realized what just happened in his house. Uh, you know, he was a little bit upset at me for that. Uh, he asked for my help. So I uh, removed a couple um, boards of plywood and some other things um, from that main area where uh, the wrestling confrontation took place with Chris and I, and a little bit in the back room for about five or 10 minutes. I grabbed uh, the pieces that had blood stains on them that he wanted me to take and put them in the back of the Nissan. Can you tell us where was there blood in the trailer after all this happened? Uh, on the floor, I on the floor, yeah, on the floor. And I believe there was probably some on the walls, um, but. I just took some pieces that were from the floor. Uh, I believe later he kind of gutted the place, but I wasn't there for any of that. What part of the flooring did you help take out? Uh, there's pieces of plywood. Um, they had screws in them, uh, just where, um, where Chris's uh, body was. And I think you indicated that when Paul Hoff talked to you about marijuana, he talked in terms of not so much a purchase, but he expected you to, to hand it over. To just give it to him, and uh, it was more than I had. Um, I could get it, and but I didn't really feel like 
I, you know, that was not what we talked about at all. I wasn't in a position to do that, not even financially. And it was just kind of like, I'm giving it to them or we're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how he left it. After this all went down, did there come a time when you had any contact with Andy Shaw? Yeah, I left. I wasn't there that long, but after I, I kind of was like, well, I can go get it for you. You know, he's, well, you need to do that today, like now. So I drove back to my house, uh, took the pieces of uh, bloodstained plywood, threw them in the back of uh, a dump trailer, threw some other things that I had from my garage that I was planning to take to the dump over them to kind of cover them up. And uh, I believe I sent Andy a Snapchat or probably a wicker. I think it might have been a wicker message. What's a wicker message? It's a double-ended encrypted messaging service where you can um, have free reign to text somebody and it doesn't show up on your cell phone or theirs. You know, it's an app. And I told him that we needed to talk today. Now, he tried to brush me off. And I told him, no, I don't care where you're at. I'm coming there now. Apart from this wicker message, did you actually talk with him? Over the um, text him or me me messaging? I might have tried to text him at first. I'm not quite sure, uh, but I know that I might have Snapchatted him as well. Um, but I definitely know that I wickered him first. But with wicker, you don't uh, necessarily get notifications all the time. So I didn't know if he didn't see it. He doesn't check it as much as I do. He's more lackadaisical when it comes to. Um, how he messages or communicates. So did you have contact with him then? I mean, direct personal contact? Yes, and that's when he told me to be out at the shop at the airport at, I believe, 9.30 or 10, or it was, you know, in, in the morning. Okay. And is this the shop we were talking about earlier? Yes, on Capitol Drive. Okay. So what happened when you got there? I got to the shop. Well, in the meantime, I. I'd spoken to Dan Castle and Dan had picked up the defendant and they were going to the job site uh, off of Beaver. I told him I had some things that I had to do, some paperwork, some stuff, some running around. And then I pulled up to the shop on Capitol Drive and I believe one of Andy's workers was there real quick. He was leaving as uh, I showed up. Did you, did you tell Shaw when, what went down? I come in and he's looking at me and I'm like, we need to talk, like now. And I asked him where his phone was. He pulled it out, I told him to turn his phone off. I turned my phone off. And then we went into a smaller room at his shop and I just kind of let it, I let it all out, kind of freaked out on him and uh, let him know exactly what happened. How do you react? What did Andy Shaw say when you explained to him what you and Drew Blonick had done?
question. What did Andy Shaw say when you explained to him what you and Dubonic had done? He said something along the lines of, oh my gosh, you really did it. Did he say anything else? He asked me what happened. And did you tell him what happened? Yes, I told him in detail exactly what happened. Okay. After you told him what happened, did he give you anything to distribute to the people who were involved? Yes. And what did he give you? He gave me uh, marijuana uh, to give to Paul Hoff. And as uh, we were packing that in a black duffel bag, he handed me a vacuum sealed um, bag with um, 10 bundles of cash. Um, another vacuum sealed package of wax, marijuana, THC extract, and what looked like to be a bundle of about 100 THC cartridges. And what instructions did he give you with the cash and the uh, THC wax and extract? He asked me to do him a favor, since I was already giving the marijuana to Paul, to uh, give the defendant the money, the THC extract, and the cartridges. Um, he said at that time that him and the defendant couldn't be seen by each other. And for me to tell the defendant that uh, he would be getting a hold of him in a couple weeks to give him the rest. Or to so, get square, I believe were his exact words, to get square. So Andy Shaw asked you to deliver a message to Drew Blonick as well, is that correct? That is correct. And what was that message? That he would, they can't be seen together and that he would get a hold of him in a couple weeks to get square. But I think you said that of the different items that, that um, Andy Shaw gave you to provide to Drew Blonick, one of them was a bag with 10 bundles of cash? Yes. 10 rolls of cash? Yes. And how much, do you know how much cash was there? I didn't count it, but I know how Andy um, <clears throat> separates and sorts his money. And uh, it appeared to be 10, $1,000, uh, 10, 10 bundles of $1,000 each. Okay. So who did you deliver to first? Uh, the defendant okay. at the job site on Beaver. So you think he went straight from Andy Shaw's shop to the Beaver Avenue address where the defendant was working on a concrete job with Dan Castle? Correct. Tell us what happened when you got there. Uh, when I got there, uh, the defendant was walking up towards the truck and Dan Castle was not far behind him. And I told him, hey, I got something from, for you from Andy. Uh, it's in this Milwaukee toolbox. Uh, the rest of it, there was a duffel bag in one of the compartments, but it was a roll away toolbox. And I handed him, I opened it up and handed him the, uh, the cash. And he took it and stuck it in his uh, jacket, inside his jacket. How about the marijuana wax and the extract? What happened to that? That uh, was still in the uh, duffel bag in the toolbox. Okay. Uh, that I took to my house and I put it in my freezer and he, he came and picked it up a couple days later. Who picked it up? The defendant. Okay. Um, and did you tell him that that was also from Andy Shaw? Yes. He knew, he knew what it was. He asked me how much it was worth. How much was it worth? Um, depending on who you're selling it to, anywhere four to 8,000. 
When you turned the cash over uh, to Drew Blonick, did any of that cash, anything go to Dan Castle? Yes. Uh, at that time, he asked me if I needed any money. I told him I asked that, you? Uh, the defendant. Okay. Told him I didn't need anything. I didn't want anything. Uh, as Dan Castle was looking at some cartridges, because uh, the defendant, and I believe I, they told him that he could grab a couple cartridges. So he was looking at the different flavors. And he, uh, the defendant stuffed a wad of money in my pocket and told me to give it to Dan. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, I did. How much money did you give him? I know it was at least 2000 I think it was a little bit more because it was two of the little bundles and I felt like it was some extra on, on top of it because it was kind of loose and the others were wrapped up in uh, uh, rubber bands. What did you tell Dan Castle was your reason for giving him cash there at the job site? I just told him uh, that the defendant said it was his um, portion from a robbery. Okay. Did Dan Castle say anything in response? Objection. That's a yes, yes or no. What was the Dan? When you gave some cash to Dan Castle, did he say anything to you in, in response? He smiled and he said, well, Wait, just no, yes, that. yes. And my next question would be, what did he say? Okay. Uh, not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, Your Honor. Uh, after you handed the money over to uh, Dan Castle, uh, did they continue with their work at that project on Beaver Avenue? No, they did not. They left? Uh, yes, they, we all went our separate ways. Okay. Where did you go? I went home. Okay. Uh, and do you know, did, did Drew Blonick leave the scene in his own vehicle then? Or do you know? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I feel like him and Dan left together. Okay. I know I pulled off first. And so you went home? Yes. What did you do when you got home? Uh, decompressed a little bit. Uh, looked at my hand. Uh, Rewrapped it. Uh, and just kind of sat in my room. Okay. Was your truck still there on the premises with the body of Chris Bagley in back? Yes, it was. It was still in the garage. Okay. Did you have any discussions with Drew Blonick about what you were going to do about that? Uh, later that night, uh, yes. Okay. Then tell us about that. What discussions did you have and how did they take place? He uh, said that he was going to pick up the truck that night and uh, take care of it. And uh, he told me that, you know, my part was done. So when you described to us how Drew Blonick said that he was going to take care of it, I mean, where did this discussion take place? Was it a telephone conversation? Was it at your residence in person or? 
I'm not a thousand percent sure. I knew we talked over the phone, but I believe it was, uh, there was messages. We, uh, Snapchatter, probably Wicker. And then uh, we talked about it in person when he actually, you know, he came and picked up the truck. So when did he come to pick up the truck? Uh, that evening. December 14th? Yes. So we're talking about a Friday night, then December 14th, the defendant came over and picked up your truck? That is correct. And did you have further discussions about what was going to be done with the body of Chris Bagley? Not that day. Okay. So what happened when Drew Blonick came back to your residence later in the evening of December 14th? Uh, picks up the truck, and then that was when he told me about a upcoming trip to Wisconsin uh, that he was leaving the next day for. What did he tell you about this trip to Wisconsin? Said that uh, him and my business partner, Dan Castle, were supposed to be going to Wisconsin together. He was supposed to drop Dan Castle off at, I think, a relative of his girlfriend on the way, but he was going for a acting, modeling, thing for the weekend. I don't know uh, what they were exactly doing there, but I know other aspiring actors and or models were meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. I believe it was Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. So uh, how did this trip to Wisconsin play into the discussion about uh, Chris Bagley's body? Um, he let it be known that he was prepared to come back from Wisconsin without Chris's body in the back of the truck. So he was going to bury Chris's body in Wisconsin. And so did he take your truck then? Yes. And the body was still in the back? Yes, it was covered up with the plywood as before. Now, this was something that Drew Blonick proposed to you. Correct. To drive up to Wisconsin with a body in the bed of the pickup truck and a piece of plywood over the body, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Didn't that concern you that he'd be driving a truck to another state and that truck was linked to you? Um, at the time, it didn't concern me. All that concerned me was the truck was off my property, to be quite frank at that point. So after Drew Blonick left for his trip to Wisconsin with your truck and the body of Chris Bagley in the back, covered by this plywood, uh, did you have any communication? Did you hear it all from Drew Blonick while he was gone? Yes. Tell us about that. A lot of the communication was early on because Dan Castle was uh, blowing me up the next day, wondering where Drew was, if I'd seen him, that Drew ditched him. He was supposed to go to Wisconsin with him. And Drew was calling me, telling me not to tell Dan that he left and that I hadn't heard from him uh, because Dan obviously could not go with him to Wisconsin because uh, Chris's body was in the back of the truck. During this time that um, Drew Blonick was gone with your truck, I mean, did he ever communicate to you that he had done something with the body up in Wisconsin? No, I 
text him, I believe, he was supposed to be back on a Tuesday, and he was not back yet, I started getting nervous, and I asked him where he was at, and he said he decided to stay an extra day or two in Madison. Okay. But he did not communicate anything to me about uh, Chris's body. Okay. Did he eventually return with your truck? Uh, yes, he did. And tell us about that. Uh, it was the next week end. I believe it was Thursday or Friday. I'm not quite sure on the day. Um, he had been messaged me on Snapchat asking me if I was home. I told him that I was in Iowa City with my daughter. He, uh, you know, since the time it elapsed, kind of been, you know, the whole situation made me very nervous. I didn't really want to be around him, definitely not be around him alone. Uh, I was actually in Marion with my daughter and about an hour and a half after, uh, I pulled into my house on Souter and I noticed that none of the lights, that um, the motion sensor lights or any of the lights that I had installed recently were lighting up as I was pulling into the driveway. As I go to get out of the vehicle, um, it's kind of icy out at this point. Um, I think it's real weird that you know the lights haven't been lighting up. I thought I heard noise, like somebody talking. Even though I kind of pulled up close to the garage at this point, I didn't notice the truck backed in to the um, to the side of the garage, and I'm helping my daughter get out of the vehicle and I'm holding their hand, and that's when I definitely hear talking and a cough. Okay. So you heard some people talking when you got home. Did you go to see who was there? After I um, took my daughter inside and put on Netflix for her, I went outside. I noticed that the light was shut off from the inside of the house um, for why the one light wasn't working. I looked over at my garage door, I saw that my garage door was open as well. Went into the garage door, flicked on the lights, and then that's when I heard talking. For sure, heard talk, two people talking on the other side of the garage, and that's when I went to investigate what was going on. I was kind of calling out, and then that's when I noticed my truck um, backed in to this, where the, uh, the side of my garage. Did you eventually find out who was talking? Yes. Who was there? The defendant and Paul Hoff. Okay. And did you have a discussion with the two of them about what they were doing at your, at your house at that time? The defendant walked forward and met me at the front of the truck. And as we're kind of talking, he's telling me to quiet down. And I look behind him and I notice a large pile of dirt. It took a couple seconds, longer than it should have, for me to realize what was going on. And then that's when I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. He told me to calm down. He walked, with, uh, he walked me into the garage, and then that's where we had a conversation. Conversation with Drew Blonick? Correct. And tell us about that conversation. He told me at that point that uh, he did not uh, bury Chris's body in Wisconsin, uh, that he had tried to bury the body somewhere else at a friend of his land, and that person said no. He had nowhere else to take it, take Chris's body. That's when he said that Paul had wanted to kill me, and he came up with a way for me to live, I guess, by burying the body at my house. At this point, he said, I could go to the police and walk away scot-free. It happened at Paul's house. Paul's not gonna say anything. I did it, and you need to have something in it too. And then that's, we were arguing back and forth, and I asked him, please, no, anywhere else, I'll, I'll help you, whatever you want, don't know. And that's when I kind of realized I didn't really have a choice in the matter. 
he at that point promised me that if everything went smooth everything was all right and I kept my mouth shut that come springtime when it died when everything died down that he would personally excavate Chris's body from my property and remove it was the body already buried when you got home I don't know all I saw was a big pile of dirt and where was the big pile of dirt it uh, was on the side of my garage um, my truck was backed in almost touching the garage and then on the what it would be the passenger side where the tailgate would probably be open that's where the pile of dirt was so the body was no longer in the truck I didn't see it I didn't walk back there because it was dark um, at this point the light I turned the lights on so you could kind of you know it was illuminated in front of the garage but I was definitely not walking to the back where it was totally dark Weren't you kind of curious, though? Didn't you want to know whether a body had been buried on your premises or not? I had already knew, known once he said that to me in the garage, but there was absolutely no way that I, with my daughter inside the house, that I was gonna has, is gonna resist. Uh, I already knew what was happening. He told me what was happening, and I, there's nothing I could do about it at that point. And uh, I just asked him, please don't do it, please don't do it. And he said, just it'll be till springtime, till it dies down, and I promise, I swear, I'll, I'll excavate it myself. And were I walked there, inside. At that time, were there any tools or equipment on your property that could have been used to, to dig a hole? Yes, there was a uh, skid loader that was probably 20 yards away from the garage. It was one of Dan Castle's friends' skid loader, who's in the concrete business as well. Um, I don't know if it had moved or not. I know there was problems with it, but I think it still operate, or it worked and operated. I didn't notice, because I kind of didn't look out that far, it was pretty dark. I didn't notice if maybe they you know, had used that instead of shovels. But they, you know, that is a strong possibility. Had you ever seen Drew Blonick operate a skid loader before? Personally, no. Uh, I'd never operated the skid loader. I don't know how to, I don't know how to operate the skid loader. That's... So where'd the skid loader come from? Um, it was Dan Castle's friend Darren's skid loader that Dan operated a lot on some jobs, and he was using it on the Beaver job at that time. Well, if you never used a skid loader before and you didn't know whether. Drew Blonick had it. What's a skid loader doing on your premises? Uh, that's where the it came on the dump trailer, and the dump trailer was there, and uh, it was driven off the dump trailer by Dan Castle. Um, a lot of times, my my house was really close to the job site, and we would just park the dump trailer there, and he drove the skid loader off of the dump trailer, so it was kind of sitting there. It ended up sitting in that same spot for a, a couple months, I believe, until Darren came and picked it up. I believe that might have been in January. Well, I understand that your daughter was with you that night, but there did come a time did, that when you went out to your backyard to see if there was an area in the ground that was disturbed? That is correct, okay. uh, the next day. Okay, and what did you see? I couldn't really see much, because um, the, the ground was like, had like a light gravel on it anyways. You could kind of see an area but not really, it's just an area where I kind of thought I was seeing where my truck was at, where I saw the dirt. And so I saw an area that looked like it was disturbed. It was all kind of, it was kind of soft there anyways. Um, so I grabbed, I know at some point, I grabbed a canoe that I found in the back of uh, the garage that I never knew was there as I was putting up a motion sensor light and I kind of pulled the canoe over it and as a feeble attempt to maybe try to cover up the uh, excavation error. So you did put the canoe over the ground that had been disturbed? Yes, up, up right next to the garage. I mean, you didn't want anyone to find a body on your premises, did you? No way. Did you place anything else over the ground besides the canoe? There was some scraps um, from the job at Beaver that we found underneath uh, um, the concrete slab that we were pouring. It was like 
broken rotted wood, stuff like that. Um, that was in the back of one of the trucks and I threw it kind of over there as well. And maybe there might have been some couple bags of trash as well. Earlier you told us about drugs and money that Andy Shaw gave to you to distribute both to Paul Hoff and um, to Drew Blonick. Was there any, were there any other payments that Andy Shaw made to uh, Drew Blonick uh, in exchange for killing Andy Chris. himself told me a couple months. As in personal knowledge, do you, do you mean uh, that items or money was handed to me? No, they were not handed to me. Okay. Anything that you, when you say, talk about personal knowledge, did, in either talking to Andy Shaw or Drew Blonick, did you become aware of any other consideration that Andy Shaw gave to Drew Blonick for killing Chris Bagley? Yes. Could I have the witness answer yes or no, Your Honor? I believe that was my question. I think you already answered yes. Okay. And what additional consideration was given to Drew Blonick for killing Chris Bagley? Objection, no, no personal knowledge. Sustained. After you learned that Chris's body was buried in your backyard, and as days progressed, did you feel like, I mean, some pressure to talk about what happened? Yeah, every day. Okay. Every single day. Okay. In fact, did there come a time when you actually put out a Facebook post about the injury to your hand, is that correct? I did that almost immediately. And I want to ask you, sir, if you would maybe use the three-ring binder again and skip up to exhibit number 68. And have you done that? Yes, I have. And do you recognize what that exhibit is? Yes. And what is that exhibit? It is a uh, picture of my uh, thumb that was lacerated from the stab wound. And did you take a picture of your injury? Yes, I did. And did you post it on Facebook? Yes, I did. With some comments? Yes. And do you believe that exhibit number 68 is a fair and accurate depiction of the Facebook post you made about your injury? That is correct. State would offer exhibit number 68 in evidence, Your Honor. Any objections, Mr. Schmees? No objections. Exhibit 68 is admitted. Ask for the court's permission to post exhibit number 68. You may do so. And, uh, Mr. Wagner, from where you're seated, can you see the, uh, the dialogue or the narrative at the top? Yes. And can you read what you wrote there? Never play the game Fast Knives with the tricky Drew Allen Blonick. Now I'm wondering if this is even a game. And apparently this is something that you've posted on Facebook four days after the killing of Chris Bagley. Is that right? That is correct. What was your reason for posting this on Facebook? Uh, people, Dan and uh, you know, a couple other people were asking me how that happened. Uh, Dan kind of 
made a comment that it was weird that it had, um, by this point, people were realizing that Chris was gone and it was weird. And he's like, well, that's weird. You know, he kind of made a, a correlation between my hand injury and also Chris being gone, asked me how I got it. And then I forgot that I had told them it was from cutting copper and I made up a joke to him that it was from the defendant messing around with a knife and he cut my hand. I uh, felt like I needed a reason why that injury was there. And I felt like, you know, he had kind of messed around with knives before with other people when we were younger. I heard some stories, so I thought maybe that'd be plausible. And I tried to kind of turn it into a joke, but also and or an excuse. A way to steer suspicion away from you. Absolutely. Did it work? Uh, nobody asked me about it again. Okay. As a day, as the days dragged on, though, and um, Chris Bagley's body still buried in your backyard, were others questioning you about whether you had something to do with his disappearance and death? Yeah, um, in the middle of January is kind of when it really started. <clears throat> <clears throat> from uh, some bounty hunters and I believe some of uh, Chris's family members. Okay. And in reaction to that, did you post uh, something else on Facebook explaining, in your words, what you claim happened to Chris Blonick, or I'm sorry, excuse me, Chris Bagley? Yes, I did. I made a Facebook post. <clears throat> I think I made a couple of them. Uh, and at one point I made a Facebook fo post about uh, how it was uh, self-defense and uh, that two people had guns that night. Okay. And the defendant and I were not those two people. I was feeling a lot of pressure because the defendant was in jail, I believe, at this time at one of the posts. I was not arrested. Uh, people had already kind of known what happened. The story had come out. The body had been found at one point. And... I was told, you know, prior to the defendant's arrest of... Uh, Mr. Wagner, I want you to take a look at the three-ring binder again and fi find, if you will, please, exhibit number 66. And I believe exhibit 66 actually is a three-page exhibit. If you could look at all three pages connected to Exhibit 66. Yeah. And do you recognize what Exhibit 66 is? Yes. And what is Exhibit number 66? Uh, a Facebook post I made. Okay. And what is that a Facebook post about? Uh, about Chris's death. Is that something that you personally wrote? Yes, it is. And do you believe that three-page document is a fair and accurate depiction about what, what you put out on Facebook about the death of Christopher Bagley? No, it is not. Okay. But as far as the way it appears, is that what you wrote back then? What was your question? That is the three-page document. Are those your actual words that you, you wrote? Those are words that I, I typed, yes. And what I mean to say, is that a fair copy of it? Yeah, that's a fair copy of it. Okay. State would offer evidence, Your Honor, exhibit number 66. And we, may we publish exhibit number 66 for the jury at this time? Are you able to read that from where you are in the witness stand, sir? Yeah. 
You want me to read the whole thing? Yeah, could you read that in its entirety? Okay. So I've been quiet long enough, enough of the lies and gossip. I've stayed quiet because a very tragic situation happened that night. If you could just slow down a little bit because okay. the court reporter is taking this down. happened that night and it has more of an impact on multiple families and myself more than anybody would know. There's a reason there wasn't an immediate murder charge. I'll say this with respect to everyone's family. Two men had guns that night and they weren't Drew and I. I was at home asleep and a friend asked me for a ride because he didn't want to drive intoxicated. An argument incurred where we were not their aggressors. I will not go into detail, but when someone pulls a loaded weapon and my life flashed before, my eyes, my brother, who is a trained Army Ranger hero, saved my life. Whether he was right or wrong, and I will be forever thankful, but he always but, he, but also understand the gravity of the situation. Mistakes were made by myself and everybody, everyone in the room after about the notification of authorities that that was a situation where our lives were still on the line because said owner of the house had the only weapons there and wasn't letting that happen. We were lucky to escape with our lives. Lastly, I would never put a human corpse at my house Anyone that knows me knows that. And Dan Castle is nothing but an innocent victim in all this as well. He has been nothing but a loyal friend and business partner through this all. A truck was not set on fire. A head gasket was blown on a truck stuck outside that had to be removed to fit my garage so it could be fixed. I'm no victim in this situation. I'm not without fault, but this wasn't a hit. Where did that come from? Two severe drug users who know nobody that has been accused of a horrific crime. If anyone, including myself, would ever do that, they should and would be in prison for the rest of their lives. I will end with this. It has been proven that the deceased was planning on robbing three families' houses that evening at gunpoint with multiple participants that evening. What if that would have happened? Would we be pointing fingers or spreading rumors without any facts. Lastly, if somebody informs or snitches in a situation like this, paperwork will come out, and if you believe that, okay, but wait for it. It's easy to hide behind fake P Facebook profiles. I'm continuing on bettering myself from this situation and trying to rectify the mistakes that were made that night. I hope the people that spread lies about the innocent people in this situation, parentheses Dan, send him an apology. He deserves that. Have a blessed day. Now, do you recall when you posted that on Facebook? Yes. Okay. And roughly when was that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the date on it. Do you know if it was before or after? Chris Bagley's body was recovered? After. Okay. And the things that you stated in that three-page document, were they true? Um, there were some truths about Dan Castle not being involved. Um, that was part of it because Dan Castle was facing a lot of uh, pressure from people because it looked like he was involved. And then also, they thought he was involved because of the burning of the truck, the Nissan, which had no part in it. That just happened to be an accident on Dan's behalf separately. So those were the true statements in that. Where you wrote, but when someone pulls a loaded gun and my life flash before my eyes, did someone pull a loaded gun on you? No, they did not. When you say, my brother, who was a trained Army Ranger hero, saved my life, was that part true? No, it was not. 
Was there ever a time during this episode that you thought your life was in any danger as a result of anything that Chris Bagley said or did? No. When you wrote that um, we were lucky to escape with our lives, was that true? No. Okay. And these statements that you and I have been just talking about now, why did you put those kind of statements in your own Facebook post? Because I was feeling pressure from all three sides. I was feeling pressure from uh, Dan Castle because he didn't have anything to do with the situation. I was feeling pressure from the supporters of uh, the defendant who were, you know, th threats and also accusations and, you know, questions about why I was not, in, not locked up and he was. And then also pressure from uh, Chris's family. So I was feeling uh, the pressure from all three sides. So I thought maybe a post, which in hindsight was not a smart decision, um, would maybe placate all three sides. You thought it might take the heat off? Correct. Okay. Did it? No. Did there come a time when you decided that um, it would be best to try to move Chris Bagley's body from your backyard? Yes. And what led to that decision? Um, Paul Hoff was arrested, and I just started getting, you know, some, before, even before Paul Hoff's arrest, I was getting some really weird feelings about um, where this was heading and uh, my personal safety. So what steps did you take then to remove Chris's body from your backyard? I had a friend of mine rent a earth warmer to try to warm up the dirt so I could excavate, find and excavate Chris's body to remove it from my house. And who was his friend? Eric Lamb. And tell us about this earth warmer. What is it? How does it work? I'm not super familiar with it. Um, Eric was more familiar with it. He's the one who kind of gave me the idea. But I believe it is a machine that uh, you can pull out cable, put it on the ground, cover it up, and it warms the earth. Um, people use it to like install fences, I believe, or you know, be able to move the ground once it's past freezing. So you enlisted the help of a friend, Eric Lamb, to rent this ground warmer? That is correct. Did you tell him why you needed it? Yes. What did you tell him? I told him what happened. Okay. He knew something was wrong with me for the last month. And he still wanted to help you? Yes. Um, did you feel confident that he would keep your secret? Yes, and towards the end, it was kind of at that point where if a good friend like him, you know, if it affected him that much where, you know, he didn't keep the secret and went to authorities, I wouldn't have been mad at him for it. I needed to confide in somebody. I, it was eating away at me every single day. And he knew something was wrong. So if I understand you correctly, your friend Eric Lamb agreed to help you rent this ground warmer. Is that that right? is correct. And how did you do that? He rented it from a place on uh, 6th Street. Do you know the name of the place? I forget. If you if you had said the name, I would know if that was the name I, off the top of my head. Were you with Eric Lamb when he rented this device? Yes, I was. Okay. And it's on 6th Street? Yes. And who paid for it? I did with, he paid with his credit card and I gave him cash. 
Did you get a receipt when you rented this ground warmer then? Yes. Okay. If you could use a three ring binder again, I want you to take a look at exhibits 38A and 38B. And do you see those two documents? Yes. And is that the receipt that you received from the company that rented that ground warmer to you, Eric Lamb? That is correct. And do you believe that those two receipts are fair and accurate copies of the receipt that you got? Yes. The state would offer an evidence, Your Honor, Exhibit 38A and 38B into evidence. Could we post 38A for the jury? So what was the name of the company then? Star Equipment. And they're located on 6th Street? Yes. Okay. And this shows that about $258 was paid to rent that ground warmer, is that right? That's correct. And if we could go and post 38B. And do you see in the middle of this document, 38B, that shows the equipment was rented for February 11th of 2019 through February 14th of 2019? Was that the approximate time that you would have had the equipment in your possession? That is correct. What happened after you were able to get this ground warmer? Uh, Eric, um, I believe, took the coils out and put them on the ground and uh, put them in a big general area because we didn't know exactly where the excavation was at. But it, we had a lot of uh, cord, and I helped him. But he did most of the work. He knew how to do it and uh, put it on the ground, and then put like a blank blankets over it. it came with like blankets. Okay. Did you ever use the ground warmer at all? Um, I believe we tried. Um, then Eric kind of disappeared for like a day or two, and I didn't really know how to do it. And uh, he, he uh, got all tangled up, and something, it wasn't working correctly. We, we knew it wasn't gonna work. Okay. And so he kind of tried to put it back together and it had some problems with like kinking. So kinking. it was returned then? Yes, it was returned. Never used? Never used. Okay. Attempted, but never used. Um, what became of Eric Lamb? Uh, Eric Lamb ended up uh, committing suicide about a month later. Apart from your friend Eric Lamb, did anybody else assist you in an effort to move uh, Chris Bankley's body from your backyard? No. Did you have any discussions at all with Drew Blonick about helping you do that? No. Okay. I didn't want him to know. Earlier you talked about this green uh, Nissan Titan, the one that you had driven out to Hoffs that morning to help him uh, clean up in the trailer. What became of that green truck? Um, about a month, maybe a month and a half after that, uh, it blew a head gasket. Uh, Dan, while I was out of town, was trying to torch off the ladder rack, or the rack that was on top of it, so we could fit it in my garage to change the head gasket. And in doing so, he welded off the rack, but I think 
some amber or some something came off the rack and was smoldering in the back of the uh, cab. He had left and it started on fire. The whole truck? Uh, yes, uh, yes, is uh, the whole truck. Just all burned up? Yes. And where did that happen? Uh, at my, my house on Souter. Again, I want you to take a look at the three wing binder if you could, sir, and turn to exhibits 76 and 77. Do you recognize what's depicted in those two exhibits? Yep, that is the Nissan Titan that uh, and, was burned. And do you believe those two photographs, 76 and 77, actually depict what your truck looked like after the fire? Yes. Okay. State would offer an evidence, Your Honor, exhibits number 76 and 77. I would ask the court's permission to publish both exhibits then to the jury. So. What do we see here in exhibit number 76? burned vehicle and do you know where this picture was taken outside of my house okay let's turn to 77 this is the same truck yeah totaled yep okay and this is a, the truck that were you telling us that was inadvertently um, burned when Dan Castle was trying to take that, that ladder rack off it? Yep. And the purpose of taking the ladder rack off it was so that you could fit it into the garage to work on it? Correct, to change the head gasket. Could you still fit, fit that truck in the garage with the ladder rack on, still on it? No. Really? He, nope, Okay. he measured it. And how about um, the Chevy that you were driving that night when you and uh, Drew Blonick transported the body of Chris Bagley from the trailer to your, your property, what became of that pickup truck? It was uh, given to a friend. And what was the name of that friend? Shane Hoffner. And why did you give it to Shane Hoffner? Hoffner. Shane uh, needed a vehicle. Uh, he was kind of in a rough spot. I let him choose between that one and a red truck. Uh, wanted him to choose the red truck because I was going to get rid of the Silverado separately and have it destroyed, but he wanted the Silverado because it was a lot nicer truck and had four-wheel drive, and I had no reasonable or logical reason not to give him that truck because I was letting him choose one or the other, so I ended up giving him that truck. So what did Shane Hoffner do for you that would justify giving him a truck? Um, he was doing a little electrical work. Um, he would help out a little bit on uh, some vehicles and our plow vehicles. But honestly, he didn't do a whole lot to deserve the truck. I just knew he was in a rough patch and needed a vehicle. And so I gave him one. Were you trying to get rid of that Silverado? I was going to get rid of it separately and have it crushed. Um, but then he chose that one over the red 1500 Silverado. And why were you wanting to get rid of that Chevy Silverado? Because uh, it possibly had DNA or you know evidence of Chris's uh, body being in the back. So you really wanted to get rid of that truck, didn't you? I was going to get rid of it either way. Uh, unfortunately, Shane wanted that truck because it was a lot better truck, and okay. he chose that one. Mr. Wagner, I want to take you to late February 2019, and do you recall there coming a time 
when the authorities came to your residence with the search warrant for your house and your premises? Yes. Okay. What do you recall about that day? I recall that um, my daughter and I were there watching Netflix. She woke up early. Um, she wanted pancakes. I went to lay back down for a minute. And uh, as I was getting dressed, uh, there was a loud banging on the door. And uh, my door got kicked in. Okay. And who kicked it in? Uh, Lynn County Sheriff's, I believe, and the FBI. Okay. And what happened after they gained entry? Uh, scared the crap out of us. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but uh, they had my uh, daughter's mother come pick her up and then proceed to question me about Chris's disappearance as they were searching the house. Okay. And when they questioned you about Chris's disappearance, did you tell them the truth? I uh, told them a partial truth. Do you recall what you told them? I recall telling them that, uh, yes, I was there that night and that uh, Drew Blonick uh, stabbed Chris Bagley in self-defense, I believe is what I said. Okay. As far as you knew at that time, was uh, Drew Blonick arrested yet? No, he was not. And recall anything else that you told the authorities there at the scene? Uh, no. Okay. I think you said that they had a search warrant for your residence? That is correct. And what did they find there? Uh, some THC cartridges. Can you I tell believe us? a little marijuana as well. I'm not 1,000% sure on that. About how many cartridges? Uh, a couple hundred, I believe. And where did you get those? Uh, from Andy. Okay. To be honest, I forgot they were even there. And was that, uh, those cartridges, those cartridges that the deputies found at your residence when they executed the search warrant, was that payment from Andy Shaw for what you would help accomplish with Chris Bagley? No, uh, those are separate. Okay. Did you ever get anything yourself from uh, Andy Shaw for the part that you played in killing Chris Bagley? I believe so. Um, he tried to pay me on multiple occasions um, by giving me cash. Um, about six weeks after this whole situation happened, I went to pay him for some marijuana, and he said that I owed him a lot less than I know I did. And I didn't know if it was a test or um, what he was getting at, but I told him how much that I got from him. And he said that he knew, and he said that I owed him, you know, about it's about four to six thousand dollars less than usual, and what he implied was that I looked out for him, so he was looking. If you could just tell us what Andy Shaw said to you during that exchange. He said that I looked out for him, now he wanted to look out for me. Okay. When the authorities were executing that search warrant uh, at your residence in late February of 2019 and they found those marijuana cartridges and the other marijuana, uh, they talked to you about the disappearance of Chris Bagley. Uh, did you tell them that the body was buried in your backyard? Not that day, no. Why not? I was scared. S scared of what it would mean for you? Yes, and scared for many other reasons. Uh, was that the only time the authorities questioned you about Chris Bagley's disappearance? Um, no, they had me drive down to the sheriff's office and speak to them that day. Okay. <clears throat> Were you under arrest at that time? No, I was not. So how did you get down to the sheriff's office? I drove. And what happened when you, once you got down to the sheriff's office? Um, they asked me a little bit more about what happened. They asked me if Andy Shaw was behind it. Um, and then towards the end, they asked me to 
walk by, I believe they had arrested or picked up Drew Blonick by this point, and they asked me to walk by a room while he was getting questioned. And tell us about this walking by a room. I mean, what was the whole point of that? I don't know, to get maybe to get him to think I was cooperating, but I refused to do it. Okay. At that time, were you telling the authorities all that you knew? No. Why were you holding back? Because I didn't want to get in trouble, and I didn't want uh, somebody that I saw as a friend at that time to get in trouble either. At that point, would it be fair to say that you were worried about the consequences that there might be for you? A thousand percent. Okay. Um, was there a third time that the investigators would have talked to you? Um, later on, uh, when they had my, to get my DNA, I believe. Okay. Um, and the detective, Buter, I believe, wanted to talk to me. And I refused to talk to him then as well. Well, you did give a third interview, didn't you, with, with your lawyer, Mark Brown? Yeah, a quick, a quick interview, yes. Okay. And at that time, the authorities were still asking you about the location of Chris's body, weren't they? That is correct. Did you disclose that? Yes, I believe it was in the third interview where I did disclose. Okay. Because um, you knew his body was in your backyard all along, didn't you? Correct. I'm trying to understand why there eventually came a time that you eventually disclosed that to the authorities when you didn't earlier on, when you could have. Well, the defendant was arrested by this point okay. and was uh, in jail, and I learned like what a marshal hold was, that he wasn't going to get out at any, any time soon. Um, and uh, it was like the weight lifted off my chest, and to be honest, I wanted uh, Chris's family to know where he was. I believe that, uh, you know, nobody should worry about where their child's at. And uh, I wanted them to maybe get some sense of closure. I know they'll never get closure, but um, a sense of understanding, I guess. So that third interview is when you told the authorities where they might locate Chris's body then, is that right? That is correct. And then did the authorities then come onto your premises and recover his body? I believe they did. I was not there. Okay. Later on, you know that the grand jury met, right? That is correct. And took evidence, took evidence and handed down indictments. You're aware of that, aren't you? Yes. Okay. And you were one of those that were indicted in connection with the death of Chris Bagley, is that right? That is correct. Okay. After you were indicted, not just for murder in the first degree, but also abuse of a corpse and obstruction of prosecution for your part in it, did there come a time when you asked if you could give a proffer or a statement um, on your behalf in connection with the killing? Yes. Okay. And why did you do that? Um. I wanted to come clean. I wanted to, um, quite frankly, see if maybe I could get lesser charges out of it. I wanted to tell the truth. There's multiple reasons for it. So you would admit that part of your motivation was self-serving? Absolutely. You wanted to help yourself? 100% correct. Okay. But you also wanted to get the, what happened out there? Yeah, that was part of it as well. Okay. It was a very... Uh, very strong load. And that's why you're testifying today? That's a good majority of it at this point. Okay. So looking back on this, the way it went down on December 14th of 2018 in Paul Hoff's trailer, uh, was this a case of self-defense where someone's life was in danger by the actions of Chris Bagley. Did you see anyone's life in danger when Chris Bagley was killed? No. 
you were present, you saw what happened. Was Chris Bagley doing, doing anything that posed a danger to anyone in that trailer when Drew Blonick stabbed him to death? No. No further questions, Your Honor. Uh, no, not really. Uh, quick passing. Uh, they took me back to the jail. The deputies did. Criticized? Uh, no, I asked them uh, if I did something wrong when the jury went to a recess, I believe. I didn't know if I had done something wrong to cause that, so I asked them. Yeah, I just asked him if I didn't answer a question correctly or if that I was the cause of why they went to a recess. I didn't know if that was a normal thing, the jury leaving. Were you given some uh, instructions about what to say? No, I've never been given instructions on what to say besides to tell the truth, no matter who asked the question. Some parts of something could be simple, okay? Okay. Correct. I've sat in the front seat of one, but I've never driven one. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Wagner, on this small issue, you were questioned about this on January 31, 2020, by the prosecution. And they showed you a picture of the skid loader that was in your yard. The skid loader level was testified to the jury. Yes, um, using a skid loader would, um, in my opinion, would be know how to move the bucket up and down and actually dig into the dirt, which I did not know how to do. Um, I'd been in the skid loader once or twice and did some circles uh, in the grass right there, but I did not know how to operate the skid loader. Again, um, by my definition, operated would mean using it in to which it is intended. And I believe a skid loader would be intended to use <laughs> a bucket to dig earth or dirt, not to drive around in circles. But if I did say that, that was just a misconception. Yeah. I just did. You told us this afternoon, or you told us this morning, that you have agreed to plead guilty to a number of charges, right? That is correct. And the charges to which you pleaded guilty were um, explained during your testimony, and you actually entered into a, a plea agreement. And if you would look at the black binder <clears throat> underneath the white binder where it says defendant's exhibits, <clears throat> Please turn to Exhibit C, like Charlie. Okay. Do you recognize Exhibit C? Yes. 
Exhibit C is the plea agreement that uh, is, details the agreement that you reach between you and the prosecution in this case, right? Correct. And in Exhibit C, does that fully describe the the uh, deal that you reach with the prosecution? Correct. Including uh, the charges you're pleading guilty to, the penalties that you're facing, and uh, the sentencing arrangement and waiver of your appeal. Is that right? That is correct. And does this fairly accurately represent your understanding of the plea agreement, the deal that you reach with the prosecution? That is correct. Okay. Your Honor, we offer Defendant's Exhibit C. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit C is admitted. We have Your Honor, we ask a permission to, uh, to uh, show exhibit C to the men and women of the jury. You may do so. Okay, um, Mr. Widener, let's take a look at the uh, defendant's exhibit C. And uh, the first uh, statement says that you have agreed to plead guilty, as we've, we've heard earlier today, to voluntary manslaughter. And uh, the exhibit reveals that voluntary manslaughter is a, what is called a Class C forcible felony. And as you've explained to us earlier today, that's punishable by um, up to 10 years in prison, and there's a mandatory five-year minimum sentence, right? Correct. Okay. Next, uh, you've agreed to plead guilty to assault while participating in a felony. That's also a class C felony, punishable by up to 10 years in prison and a mandatory five years because, quote, you knew your accomplice was armed with a dangerous weapon, right? Correct. And uh, the so-called accomplice is Mr. Blonick? Correct. Next, you agreed to plead guilty to another uh, conspiracy charge, conspiracy to commit a forcible felony, and the conspiracy that you uh, claim to be um, joining was a conspiracy to commit voluntary manslaughter. Is that right? Correct. And can you, uh, we're gonna talk about what voluntary manslaughter is in just a minute, but um, Mr. Wagner, is, is it your understanding that when you get sent to prison on these charges that you're facing a mandatory prison term of up to 10 years, right? Correct. And after 10 years, the Iowa Board of Parole can parole you, can't they? Correct. So uh, even if you're facing a mandatory 10 years, um, that could be it. You could be paroled after that. Correct. When you were being charged with first-degree murder, what were you looking at? Life. Life without parole. Correct. And um, there's no way that you can be released before the end of your natural life unless you get a commutation or a pardon from the governor. Isn't that true? I, ob I object to this series of questions, Your Honor, in insofar as it asks for the witness to um, provide a legal opinion. As for he's got to sustain the objection of your speech, but do you mind asking his understanding? Okay, so uh, Mr. Uh, Wagner, you could you could not get out of prison before the end of your natural life, could you? I don't believe so. No. Um, and as you've explained for the men and women of the jury, the understanding was that part of the concession that you were able to negotiate was in exchange for your agreement to testify against Mr. Blonick. Correct. And um, importantly, if the prosecution felt that you weren't holding up your end of the bargain, they could pull it out from under you, couldn't they? That's correct. And if they thought that uh, you weren't either cooperating or providing a testimony that they considered to be truthful, they could pull it out and charge you back again with first degree murder. That's correct. The, um, the next stage in, after you reach this plea agreement, by the way, you reached this plea agreement after you had uh, talked to the investigators, you had talked to, um, you had a couple of proffer sessions, and tell the men and women of the jury what a proffer, P-R-O-F-F-E-R is. Um, that is when uh, 
my lawyer and I um, would go to a meeting and answer questions based on what happened. Yeah, and, and that's also a separate deal, isn't it? A proffer agreement? Why do you I'm confused? A separate deal? Yeah. Uh, the proffer is that in exchange for your uh, giving your side of the story, the prosecution agrees not to use it against you. I believe so. And how many proffers did you have with, Two. with the government? Two. Two. Um, and the second one was because you hadn't told the complete truth in the first one, isn't that right? That is correct. Even though in that first proffer agreement you promised to tell the truth, and you were in fact under oath, weren't you? That is correct. So um, not only did you not uh, uphold your end of the bargain by telling the truth, but you violated an oath as well. That is correct. So um, after the first proffer agreement, you had a second proffer agreement, and then the, that second proffer agreement also provided an understanding that whatever you said there would not be used against you? I believe so. And after that second proffer agreement, you were able to negotiate it, this plea agreement with the prosecution? I, yeah, that, my lawyer uh, handled that, I believe. Well, your lawyer was acting on your behalf. Yes, that is correct. So then there was a substitute charge uh, brought against you that was described in the plea agreement, right? A what? A, a substitute charge. What would be the substitute charge be? Amended and substituted trial information. Look at Exhibit D, please. D. Okay. Oh, you mean the charges were changed from first degree murder to these? Right. That was taken off the table and you pled guilty to these. Correct. Charges. Okay. Correct. Is Exhibit uh, D, uh, Mr. Wagner, the charge to which you pleaded guilty in this courtroom? That is correct. Okay. We offer defendants Exhibit D, Your Honor. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit D is admitted. Okay, we're going to take a look now, um, Mr. Wagner, at the charge to which you pleaded guilty. And first, we're going to take a look at count one. Pull that up. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, and we ask permission of the court, of course, to, to demonstrate this to the jury. Permission. Thank you. Do you have there in front of you, uh, can you see uh, uh, Mr. Wagner count one, voluntary manslaughter? Yes. The, uh, the charge to which you pleaded guilty says that on December 14, 2018, you uh, caused the death of Christopher Bagley as a result of sudden, violent, an irresistible passion resulting from serious provocation knowing that your accomplice was armed with a dangerous weapon. And that is what you admitted to in open court in this courtroom, didn't you? That's correct. And can you tell the men and, men and women uh, what an Alford plea is? Do you know what that is? I believe that is a plea where you do not admit guilt but if you took it to trial, a jury might find you guilty. I'm not a thousand percent correct on that. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, and this was not an Alfred plea, was it? No, it was not. So you just admitted straight up that you committed voluntary manslaughter? Yes, I did. And you did that because it was a killing as a result of a sudden, violent, and irresistible passion. Was that your sudden, violent, and irresistible passion? Yes. And it was re the result of serious provocation by whom? I don't know who would, by the serious provocation? Well, the serious provocation has to come from Chris Bagley, doesn't it? I guess from the wording there, that yeah. Well, that's not only the wording, that's what you pleaded guilty to. Correct. And you admitted to this court that that's what you did? Yes. Let's take a look at uh, the second count to which you pleaded guilty.
and as you told them, uh, the court and the men and women of the jury, you pleaded guilty to count two, assault while participating in a felony. And again, you admitted that you assaulted Christopher Bagley while participating in a felony, causing serious injury, knowing that your accomplice was armed with a dangerous weapon. So you admitted that you assaulted Christopher Bagley? Yes. And um, you were participating in a, a felony, and the felony was voluntary manslaughter, right? That is correct. And that was the truth? Yes. So when you were assaulting Christopher Bagley, and you were doing it in the, in the process of, of committing voluntary manslaughter, were you acting as a result of, a, of an irresistible passion provoked by Mr. Bagley? Yes. And that resulted in his death? Correct. Not a premeditated killing, but a, a killing a result, as a result of a provocation by Chris Bagley. I believe you're picking and choosing your words there, but. Did you say pick and choose your words? I believe you're picking and choosing your words by premeditation. Uh, I believe you would mean uh, planned ahead of time, correct? Is that Did what you mean? These aren't my words, these are your words, Mr. Well, I'm just asking, you said premeditation, so I was asking you your thought on what premeditation was. Sorry if there's some confusion. Something well, you weren't be... admitting, yeah, I'm sorry. You weren't admitting you committed premeditated killing, you admitted you killed him as a result of a passion that he provoked. Just a, could you repeat that? Yeah, you're admitting that you committed a killing based on a passion that Mr. Bagley provoked. Yes, that's what voluntary manslaughter is listed as right there. And that's what you admitted to doing? That is what I admitted to doing, correct. Um, you also described for us earlier this morning that you had been charged with a new charge. And I know that this plea agreement encompassing drug charges that you were facing, right? That is correct. And then you've, you, you, you got a new charge in the jail? Yes, sir. And what, what was that about? Uh, that was uh, introduction of uh, contraband, I believe, into a facility. And someone was trying to get drugs into you? Uh, correct. And you knew it? Yes, I did know it. So what, uh, what we're going to do now, um, Mr. Wagner, is we're going to kind of march through again your involvement in the investigation. Okay. <clears throat> and I know that, uh, as you've told us just moments ago, in February of 19, or excuse me, of 2019, law enforcement people came to your home and they uh, were searching your home, right? Correct. And you weren't arrested at that time. No, I was not. And you. Uh, were interviewed there at your home, and then, uh, what, a day or two later, you went to the sheriff's office? I went to the sheriff's office uh, that day. Okay, on February 23rd. That is correct. And then um, you were questioned how many times on February 23rd? Uh, once at my home and once at the sheriff's uh, office. And then you were questioned again on February 27th. That is correct. And where did that interview take place? At the sheriff's office. <clears throat> Were you under arrest at that time? No, I was not. Okay. And uh, then we know that you were eventually uh, represented by counsel after you were arrested, right? Correct. And then on January 31st, 2020, that was your first proffer, your first interview with the government. That is correct. And then your second proffer was on March 31 of 2020. That is I'm correct. sorry, yeah, 2020. I believe that date is correct. Now, in each one of these interviews, the expectation of the law enforcement people who were talking with you was that you were going to tell them the truth. Correct. And we understand, of course, that, you know, when you're 
uh, shocked or surprised by being arrested, you may not tell the whole truth. Correct. And that was the case for you, right? Absolutely. And probably the case for Mr. Blonick as well. I can't comment on his okay. thought process. So, um, at the beginning of the, the afternoon uh, session this this, uh, this afternoon, Mr. Vandersanden asked you if, when you and Mr. Blonick went over to to Paul Hoff's trailer, it was your intention to kill Chris Bagley. And you're telling the men and women of the jury that that was your intention. My intention personally or our intention as a group? Well, I know that that was the, the, the explanation you gave, but it was your Correct. intention, wasn't it? What was my intention? Sorry. It was your intention that Chris, Chris Bagley would be killed. That is what was spoken of before we went, correct. Well, was it, not to argue with you, but was it your intention? Yes. Um, at the time that you were involved with Mr. Shaw and, and others, you yourself were involved in drug dealing, weren't you? Yes, I was. And you were involved in dealing what kind of drugs? Uh, marijuana and THC cartridges and marijuana extract. And how long have you been dealing in drugs? Since 2006, the end of 2016, early 2017. And then before that, um, in 2000. Eight, nine, and ten, and then a little bit in high school as well. So Always who, marijuana. Yeah. Who was your principal supplier of marijuana? Um, at what time? Well, let's say in proximity to when this all happened in 2018. Andy Shaw. Then you know who his supplier was. Uh, no, I. There's some guesses, but I, uh, this isn't the place to do that. And where, uh, where were you storing the drugs that you were getting from Andy Shaw? Uh, different places. Um, towards the end, there was a ro lot of robberies and stick-ups happening, so I would only try to grab what I could get rid of that night. I didn't try to keep much on hand because that would end up being an issue. Um, before that, um, storage garage or a friend's house or a uh, or the shop. Did you keep it in your own home? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, where your your daughter would spend time with you? At that point, she d was not staying with me. But every once in a while, there'd be some overlapping, and I would uh, keep it in the garage. So, how much money were you making in your drug activity? Uh, depend from uh, week to week. It uh, varied. Sometimes not much. Sometimes a lot. Well, give us a range. On a typical week, uh, at the end of 2018, a couple thousand dollars a week. What was your best week? Maybe 10,000. And what were you doing, doing with your money? Putting it back into the concrete company, buying equipment, um, giving it to friends, helping people out. Didn't save it as much as I should have. Did you uh, bank any of that money? Uh, no, you have an issue when you're trying to deposit large uh, sums of cash into the bank. So I, was I, buy I was buying assets, you know, buying vehicles, work trailers, tools, equipment, things that are worth money that I could sell if I needed to, but trying not to keep much cash on hand and not making any large bank deposits because it might provoke uh, investigation or suspicion? A thousand percent, yes. Right. And you were concerned you didn't want to structure a cash deposit because that could cause investigation as well? Anything over 9,900, I believe. Um, so was Mr. Castle aware that you were investing your drug money into his business, in your business? Yes. He was aware it was drug money? Absolutely. 
Well, tell us how Mr. Castle was involved in your drug operation. Uh, he wasn't. Um, he wasn't selling any drugs. He would just get them from me for free. Uh, he profited or benefited from getting a lot of free things. And as I said earlier, when you asked where the money went, I gave a lot of the money away to friends who needed it, and he was one of them. Did you sell drugs to him? I gave them to him every once in a while. Um, maybe I would sell him some cartridges, but 90% of the time it was just given. It was a perk for him. Well, how much money did you think you sunk into your business that was drug money? Um, 30000 Over the course of how long a period of time? Maybe more. Um, over the course of five, six months. Um, Mr. Wagner, I want to turn to your relationship with uh, Christopher Bagley, okay? Yes, sir. And you've told us how you uh, knew Mr. Bagley, and um, was he a drug partner with you at any time? Not a partner. Um, every once in a while, he would uh, purchase marijuana off me. Uh, towards the, uh, the fall of 2018. How much was he buying from you? A couple pounds. Um, this is kind of when he had a falling out with Andy. Um, I didn't really ever want to give him too much, but you know, maybe you know, 5,000, 6,000, nothing really more than that. <clears throat> How often were you selling him pounds? Some weeks, none. Some weeks, a couple times. It just depended. Uh, he only came to me if he really needed it, because I would just give it to him for cost. Did, did you know where else he was getting uh, marijuana? Um, Andy, on and off, because um, their relationship was up, up and down from about August of 2018 up until, his, uh, up until October, the end of October, when that first robbery occurred. Other than that, um, I do not know where he um, procured his marijuana. I have no idea. Uh, did you consider Mr. Bagley a personal friend? When we first met, yes. Um, at some points, yes. Um, towards the end, not so much. I just got a very weird feeling or vibe off of him. I got a what? A, a very weird feeling or vibe off of him. I felt like something changed in his head in regards to the relationship that we had with each other. Well, did you know Mr. Bagley was doing methamphetamine? I had found out that Mr. Bagley and you know, Dan Castle were doing large amounts of methamphetamine towards the end. Um, but I had always known that he had dabbled in methamphetamine from the time that I met him. I think it got uh, progressively worse for him um, towards the fall of 2018. Worse in what way? His personality, he was a different person. Mr. Bagley was? Yes. How did he exhibit this, this difference in personality? Just uh, by his mannerisms, um, just who he was. He was just, you know, the person I met at first was uh, totally different. The first person I met was um, caring, I guess, in a way, um, outgoing, um, engaging, make you laugh, um, cared about you, tried to help you out. And then the person that I knew at the end was uh, totally different person. Well, um, was he paranoid? Very paranoid from what I saw, but I was not around him much the last um, month and a half of his life. Um, was he um, impulsive? I believe so. Angry? Not to me um, personally. I, so I can't really tell you if he was angry. Um, I wouldn't really know that. Suspicious? Yes. He was always asking me if I was his friend. I'm sorry? Whenever I would, whenever I would see him, he would always ask me if I was his true friend. It, it, but suspicious, yes. Um, did he ever tell you that he thought that the police were after him? 
I had heard that um, through Dan Castle, and I had heard him um, in snippets um, after, he, um, I believe, there was an incident where a raid may have happened by the Marion police in September of uh, 2018. I believe I heard that being said by him a couple times in Dan Castle. Did you think he was being tracked? Yeah, I, I, one time he was talking about drones or something. I'm sorry? One time he was talking about drones uh, following him. Or that his, his, uh, his vehicle might be tracked? I'm going to this line of questioning now that it seems to be called for hearsay. And it has a bridge. <laughs> yes, but, uh, we just got what we got. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, in talking with counsel, I, I think uh, it would be a good idea to recess for the day at this time. We'll have to go back at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Remember the resolution during recess. All right.